Okay, it's very easy for problems like these to get lost in the details of how to do the problems and sort of forget about what it is we're actually solving for. And so I want to emphasize that we are figuring out stresses on various planes within the location that we're interested in. And I like to use this as an example to sort of remind you what we're doing. If we look at this stress configuration, we can see that we have only applied shear stress. So in other words, I want you to envision that we actually built something like this in the lab. We built a little square, and we are applying to that square um, shear stresses. So I apply eight here, another eight here, eight here, eight there. Everything's in equilibrium, and that's what we put on that little square. We don't apply any normal stresses. And notice, I haven't shown any normal stresses. So if I don't show any normal stresses, it means they are zero. Okay, so if, the, if a stress is not shown, it means that stress is zero. Same thing if I show you, if I show something with no shear stresses, then that means that the shear stress is zero. Now, okay, so assume that we, we built this little square um, in our lab, and we are applying a shear stress in that direction, a shear stress in that direction, shear stress in that direction, shear stress in that direction, and we measured the deformation of the square, what would we find? We'd see that, um, that the... Um, It would no longer be, oops, it would no longer be a square, it would become a parallelogram like that. It would, you know, we, it would stretch out this point, would get farther away from that point. So in other words, this point gets farther away from that point. This point would get closer to this point. So in other words, this point gets closer to that point. That's going to give us a clue regarding the stresses that we're actually going to get on different planes. So what we're going to do is we're going to draw the Mohr circle for this situation. It's quite simple to draw. And then our question is, does this produce tension or compression? That's the question. Notice we're only applying shear stresses. And the question becomes, have we created tension even though we've only applied shear stresses? Have we created compression even though we've only applied shear stresses? So the Mohr circle answers that question for us quite simply. So here's, here's what do we do with the Mohr circle, okay? We do what we always do. We look here. What do I see? Zero, eight. I look here, what do I see? Zero, negative eight. That gives me my two points. So yeah, my zero, eight is on the horizontal plane. My zero, negative eight is on the vertical plane. So zero, eight, horizontal plane. Zero, eight, vertical plane is very simple. There's, there's one point, there's the other point. Well, what do I draw it like that. The center of the circle is in the middle, and I get my radius. is quite simple. It's 8. I draw the whole thing. It takes two seconds to draw the Mohr circle for that, which is the, the beauty of drawing the Mohr circle is that, in a lot of cases, it's extremely simple, and it points things out. And then what do I see? I see that sigma 1 is equal to 8. Sigma 3 is negative 8. So, what do we find? Indeed, sigma 1 is a tension. Sigma 3, since it's negative, is a compression. And we find that, even though we have only applied shear stresses, so we applied those shear stresses, we have created a tensile 
stress, and we have created a compressive stress. And this makes sense because, as I said, when we apply these stresses, we get a shape that looks like that. And you can sort of envision that in certain cases we get this sort of situation whereby, you know, we could separate this, you know, and they separate, okay? So we get a tensile failure, for instance, even though we only apply shear stresses. And so what we've, so this is what the Miller circle is about. It gives us the stresses on this plane. I know the stresses on that plane. The stresses on that plane are eight tensile stresses. That's that 45 degree plane that we're looking at. How do we know that those are the stresses on that plane? Because um, we can fill out our table. I can start on the horizontal plane. So again, I'm, we're gonna, what do we do? We do real first, the real world. I'm trying to find the stresses on this plane. When I start at the horizontal plane, I go 45 degrees counterclockwise to get to that plane. So horizontal plane, 45 degrees counterclockwise, and more, I go, I start at the horizontal plane, I go 90 degrees clockwise. So following these instructions, I start at the horizontal plane, I go 90 degrees clockwise, takes me right to there. So I learn the stresses on this plane. So, similarly, um, you know, what do I see? If I were to look at a plane in here, this plane, well, that plane has got to be under compression, doesn't it? Because how do I know that? Because, I mean, the other way to logically figure it out or get a feel for it is to realize that this point gets closer to that point. Well, it, they get closer together because they're, there's compression taking place, that these two... These two are basically being squeezed together. So we could figure out the plane for that as well. And of course, it would be on what? It would this, this plane here. So it would be this 45 degree plane here. And we could logically go through that um, more circle table, go through that table with the other plane, but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go through that right now. So what we're showing though is that we, when we have this plane, this 45 degree plane, I'm showing it over here, we have what? We have that eight. It's that eight right there that acts on that plane. Okay, I'm not gonna we're not gonna go through this. Um, but I want you, I'm not going to go through it in detail, but I want you to do this problem. Find the plane on which sigma 1 acts. Draw the circle. Do everything you need to do. I will, uh, you, need, you pause the video here and work this problem. Well, all right, um, we've done a lot of these, so I'm not going to go through this one more time, but um, give this one a shot, and I'll send you the solution, I guess. I guess I don't have it in front of me. I thought I had it. All right, I want to do another more circle for another simple situation, and that is water pressure. If you remember about water pressure from your fluids class or physics class. What do we know about the two rules, two rules for water pressure? Rule number one, the pressure is depth times density. Rule number two, the direction is perpendicular to the surface and its compression. Those are the two, two basic rules of water pressure. Very simple. So we have this tank of water here. There's the water level right there. And we're going to consider a little square at five feet depth. And we are going to plot the Mohr circle for that. 
Well, we know that the density of water, 62.4 pounds per cubic foot, which you should know because for both mechanical and civil engineers, that is a number you will be working with for the rest of your life, and you just need to know it. Um, so what is our water, what, what does it look like? Well, 5 times 62.4 is 312. We follow our rules, then that the direction is perpendicular compression. So what do I have? Well, I got my little square here. So that means what? I have 312 going that direction, 312 that direction, 312 this direction, 312 this direction. Every direction we have 312. So we're going to draw, the, again, a very simple Mohr circle for this. It's so simple, we don't have to think about it practically. So I look over, so how do I do it? I do the same methodology here. I look here, what do I see? First, first I don't have any shear stresses, right? Because water has no shear strength, so we don't have shear stresses. Except for a very little bit, but we're, we're not, uh, when, when in moving water, you'll have some little shear stresses, we're not going to consider that. And this water is stationary. So I look there, what do I see? Negative 312, zero. So I put that there. I look over here, what do I see? Negative 312, zero. <laughs> so what do I find? Well, both points are the same point. What happens? What has happened? The circle, more circle is no longer a circle. The more circle is just a point. That means it doesn't matter what plane I look at. I can look at that plane. I can look at that plane. I can look at some other plane. It doesn't matter here. What angle I'm always going to have the same stresses on it. And they will always be 312 compression. So, all right, um, what does that mean? <laughs> Let's look at some other situations. So, just if I have this, what do I have? Well, negative 12, 0. Negative 12, 0, so that's what we just got done doing. So, my more circle is a point. Again, it doesn't matter if I want to find out the stresses on that plane. Well, I know it's negative 12. I don't have to do any calculations. And again, this is the one that we looked at for um, the shear stresses only. What do I see? Well, I see what? I see negative 8 here. I see positive 8 there. So I plot that more circle. Sorry. That's zero negative eight. That is zero positive eight. Zero negative eight. Zero positive eight. I draw the circle. And as we concluded that this stress condition creates tension and compression. And then if I want to plot A different square for that same stress configuration, it looks like this. So what are we saying here in a sense? Um, what we're saying is this stress configuration and this stress configuration are exactly the same. Although they look different, these stress conditions are the same. Why? because they create the same circle. So, sometimes we'll use this trick in the lab. In other words, suppose, you know, sometimes, in other words, sometimes shear stresses are difficult to create in the lab. So rather than doing that, we do this in the lab and we get the same result. Okay, the last topic related to this is failure. And I will do that on the next 
on the next video that I do.